Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Groom Weekend Review. I'm Hovik Monacharyan. This week we're going to talk about the following major topics. Lebanon in crisis. Taliban takes over Afghanistan. The 8th convocation of the Armenian parliament. And we'll also cover developments around Artsakh. And to talk about these issues, we have with us Aspet Kochikian, who is an associate professor of political science and international relations at the American University of Armenia. Benjamin Pogosian, who is chairman of the Center for Political and Economic Strategic Studies, a Yerevan-based think tank. He was deputy director of the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the Ministry of Defense between 2010 and 2016, and vice president for research at the National Defense Research University from 2016 to 2019. And we also have Katya Peltekian, who has been teaching at the American University of Beirut since 1988. She has published two books, which compile newspaper articles and reports uh, from the genocide years published in Canadian and British press. Katya has been compiling news for the Armenian News Network Groom since 1999. This episode was recorded Monday, August 16, 2021. Hello and welcome everyone. Hello, Hovik. Hello, thanks. Thanks for having us. Hello. Hi, everyone. So we're going to work our way uh, from the outside in this time, looking at what's going on around Armenia first. This week, uh, Lebanon has been at the top of our minds. Uh, so we will let's, let's start with that. And uh, given that we also have Katya as our guest. So even before the disastrous Beirut port explosion, explosion in 2000 in august 2020 lebanon had been in a political and economic crisis uh, after prime minister hassan diab's resignation following the explosion the country's currency has gone into free fall it seems and the official exchange rate used by the central bank is uh, 3900 lebanese pounds to one usd meanwhile on the black market the exchange rate is uh, i guess about five times as much while fuel gas flour medication and food was subsidi- subsidized until recently the central bank is removing many of these subsidies, meaning that people cannot afford uh, basic necessities. While uh, until recently there was gas and electricity rationing uh, around two to three hours per day, you know, after the central bank subsidies were removed, the distributors are hoarding uh, resources and we're hearing of complete electricity blackouts. At a high level, what is the political cause for this you know, crisis? And uh, more importantly, I guess, how do we get out of it? Aspet? Well, um, I don't think there is any end in sight and any way to get out of it. Uh, one thing we need to realize that this has been a problem and an issue in the making since 2009, you know, with the financial collapse back then and the uh, Lebanese uh, sectarian system where the different sort of the elite have been follow uh, have been borrowing money without any restraints and without any sort of limitations to pay off the debt that the country owns so think of it as a big pyramid scheme right uh, the country's elite the political elite has been borrowing money to uh, to pay for the debt that they already had now um, one of the things that happened is that uh, some uh, some of the listeners might remember that in October 2019, in a way to find new revenues, the government decided to tax WhatsApp calls, as a result of which, you know, there were mass demonstrations. So the financial crisis was already in place. Now, this is 2019. Uh, the existing financial problem, uh, uh, the, the, the financial crisis and so on, was only aggravated by the port explosion. And then, uh, of course, prior to that, the COVID uh, raising, uh, rising pandemic. The challenge here is that um, as this was going on, the political elite was more interested in internal uh, squabbles rather than, you know, coming up with any solution. Uh, You know, they had at some point a government in place which resigned right after the explosion. And at the time, the prime minister, uh, Hassan uh, Hassan Diab, actually did uh, blame uh, rampant corruption as being one of the main reasons of of the the tragedy. But then, since then, because of the existing uh, internal divisions, the Christians were actually boycotting the the decision to make a government uh, and successive prime ministers designated uh, were not able to uh, form government. So on top of the financial crisis, you had the explosion, you had the pandemic, and uh, you also ended up having uh, successive uh, prime minister uh, designates who haven't been able to form government. So this has actually contributed to not only the financial crisis, uh, to not only the worsening of the crisis and the government's 
central bank trying to, uh, the central bank in Lebanon trying to find solutions, which actually have been complete and utter failures. So this is where Lebanon stands today. Uh, it is in the, on the brink, it's just not on the brink even, I think it's in the abyss. And as someone uh, who has uh, lived and um, you know, thought or followed Lebanese news, this is unprecedented in Lebanese history, in modern Lebanese history. Now, a lot of historians are uh, bringing it up, uh, uh, analogies and uh, comparisons with the turn of the 20th century when there was widespread famine during the First World War and a lot of people lost their lives and so on. But the, the tragedy now is multifold. Um, you know, no electricity, uh, no gas, um, uh, no medicine. You know, people are actually, even if they can get, I, I have been uh, talking with doctors, uh, friends of mine, and they're not prescribing medicine because there is no medicine. Um, and the coup de grace in all of this was a statement that uh, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Katya also shared and, and knows about at the American University Medical Center, where they said that they don't have enough, um, uh, enough power to keep the respirators going. And when they lose power, there will be at least 50 people who will die immediately and another 200 people who will not be able to have machines, dialysis machine, and so on and so forth. So all of this in the larger context of rivalry that exists on the one hand between Iran and on the other hand with the Gulf countries. Because Hezbollah, the Shia militia, uh, one of the largest uh, representatives of the Shia groups, uh, uh, representatives in Lebanon, has been on the rise. And as a result, countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar haven't been um, providing support to uh, the Lebanese government. So uh, rivalries, proxy wars, Ending, uh, ending up in uh, manifesting itself uh, with uh, the crisis in Lebanon now. And, um, you know, what, what is the status of the EU pledge to support Lebanon financially? And can that help alleviate anything? Well, the problem, Hovig, is not just about the promises. You know, right after the explosion, uh, uh, Macron uh, came to Lebanon, the French president Macron came to Lebanon and he pledged help and assistance and so on. You know, I remember about six months ago, the Lebanese army as a guarantor of Lebanese security. Um, now we can argue if it uh, has done its job or not in the past. They actually appeal to the international community to provide them with food stuff, right? We're not talking about equipment. They said, we need food to feed our, so uh, our soldiers. Um, the pledges, you know, the, one of the things that we don't realize and people don't understand is that when there is an international pledge of assistance and so on and so forth, it takes a long time, first of all, to realize that. And a pledge is not the same as giving money. The best example that comes in my mind is that about 10 years ago when there was an earthquake and then a tsunami in Haiti, there was over $20 billion pledged uh, to, to support uh, Haiti in its reconstruction and development. None of it was realized or some of it was realized. And then even when the money comes in, right, this is an issue of political uh, organization. There is no functioning government. Who is going to handle, uh, you know, the crisis? Who's going to deal with it? And at, on the one hand, you have groups who are boycotting, uh, you know, forming government, formation of government and so on and so forth. And on the other, uh, there are groups that are trying to uh, just um, impose their will. So even if, you know, suddenly there is, um, I don't know, um, you know, $30 billion dropped from air with equipment and so on and so forth, the distribution, um, you know, the operation and so on. I mean, this is the ultimate example of a failed state. I cannot think of, uh, at least as much as I know, of an example of a failed state, uh, a fragile state, failed state. You know, even in academic term, now they use failed, uh, fragile state rather than failed state. I mean, Lebanon is beyond fragile. It has, it has failed utterly and completely. Katia, how are the blackouts affecting you? And overall, you know, can you give us your perspective on the situation? Uh, the blackout uh, in most areas, yes, it's a 24 hour blackout. My area is getting two hours from the, uh, you know, it's a government uh, company. So we're getting two hours and then the rest of the time uh, the generators are working. Because of the fuel shortage now, even uh, the generators are being rationed like somewhere between six to ten hours. Uh, so in this heat, you know, um, most of the time the generator is not working the fridge is not working the ac is not working uh, and we wait for you know 
some blessing from up above. So it depends on the areas. Uh, a lot of rural areas have no electricity whatsoever. There's, uh, um, we have neighborhood generators. We have uh, some buildings have their own generators, but they are all rationing, definitely. It's not just the electricity. Amazing. Yeah, it's like we don't have they gasoline. Have and yesterday's explosion was because people were like waiting in line for the gasoline and they found out that someone was hoarding them, hiding them. Um, there was a fight between two people. The rumor is that someone threw a butt of cigarette into the fuel near the fuel tank and it exploded. I guess when the system is strained, uh, you know, it's much easier to have. Um, you know, it was a fake, fake system like since the war stopped in 1990. Since the civil war stopped, it was a fake system, a fake exchange rate, fake everything. Everything was hidden, you know, um, and then all of a sudden they realized that, you know, um, the exchange rate is, uh, is not the right way of doing it. They had fixed it on 1,500 and that was it. While the market was supposed to go up and down, you know, fluctuating, it, it didn't, it was fixed. Um, then they started raising salaries when the central government, uh, central bank said that we cannot afford that. And then the whole revolution in uh, October uh, 2019 started because of that. And since that so-called revolution, things have been going worse. We were begging people for uh, our medications. We don't have medications. The pharmacies are closing. Uh, today, apparently, the bakeries are closing because they don't have fuel to make the bread. And we also read that uh, the AUB, uh, even hospitals are sort of, you know, basically closing down or rationing si significantly, right? AUB had already decided that we will be teaching uh, online because they cannot afford to have the generators working. So although the whole world, because of Corona, somewhat they were going back to campus, uh, AUB informed us that, you know, you're going to be online at least in September. And then two, three days ago, we were informed that, you know, they don't have enough fuel for the hospital. And it's, it's the largest hospital uh, in, in Lebanon. Um, and today we got note that several of the campus buildings have no Wi-Fi. So we're supposed to start classes on August 30. I don't know how. Our next choice is, you know, if not in cam on campus or in class and not online, I think we're going to use telepathy. That's the only choice we have left. But but when they give power, do they at least give it at the same time so that students can join? No, 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 they don't give it. Like I get it one uh, one hour from nine to ten, for example. The neighborhood next to mine gets from ten to eleven. The other one gets it from eleven to twelve, and then they rotate and it comes back to me in the evening and it rotates again. <clears throat> so there's no way that we can recharge our laptops or you know. <laughs> or even the UPSs. It brings back memories when I used to study on candlelight during the civil war in Lebanon. So Some say that it's actually even worse than the civil war. What, what is your thoughts? Yes, it is. Thoughts? Yes, it definitely is uh, worse because we never had... Yeah, there were lineups in front of bakeries, but it, uh, we always had, you know... Um, electricity except when in 1982 when Israel invaded you know Lebanon and Beirut was under siege for over 40 days those are the 40 days that we did not have electricity whatsoever um, it this one is worse because we have shortage of everything water electricity fuel bread uh, medication hospitals uh, doctors are leaving so it's a catastrophe. And, and and as a last, maybe short uh, sort of update, um, you know, uh, what is the status of the Armenian community? I mean, obviously, the entire country, if the entire country is, you know, uh, is in distress, then so is the Armenian community. But is the community self-organizing to help uh, Armenian citizens? Or is there any sort of, I haven't heard anything from the Ministry of Diaspora. Is there anything Armenia can do? Granted, I don't like at least I, I don't see anything uh, that can be done uh, remotely. If you know, if major powers, if France and uh, 
you know, uh, major world powers can't do anything. Uh, but but you know, I just wonder, was wondering if you if you've seen or heard anything. From Armenia's perspective, the country of Armenia's perspective, I mean, um, there isn't much being talked about. And uh, Katya might be able to better uh, sort of explain the situation. But um, you remember after the explosion, there were two uh, plane loads of medication and food that were sent to, uh, to Lebanon, uh, one for the community and one for, the, you know, overall uh, to distribute in the country. But um, as of now, uh, I haven't heard or I am not aware of any Armenian government sort of uh, uh, like a relief package going uh, getting to uh, Lebanon. And also don't forget uh, one, one last thing before um, I pass it on uh, to Katya is that, you know, the Armenian community is part of the Lebanese fabric, social, economic and political. Uh, even though there might be remittances coming in, even there might there might be the worldwide Armenian community helping Lebanon, um, you know, it's not going to get anywhere. See, the challenge is not getting the money. Even you have the money, you can't find things. Uh, Benjamin, uh, I wanted to ask you if you have any thoughts or if you have heard anything from the Armenian side about the situation. Uh, currently, no. Immediately after the explosion in August 2020, uh, there were a lot of discussions in Armenia that maybe it's the right time to facilitate uh, the coming back of Lebanese Armenians for Armenia, or repatriation of Lebanese Armenians for Armenia. So there were a lot of discussions that, okay, we should support Lebanese Armenians, but because after all, Lebanon was a failed state, and even in August 2020, it was obvious that there are no quick fixes. The main idea was the Armenian state or general Armenians as a nation, they should focus their attention on how to bring these Lebanese Armenians back to Armenia. And at that time, you know, there were a lot of discussions that, okay, let's back, bring them back to the Artsakh, to the liberated territories. And we all heard about this very sad story of this uh, poor Lebanese woman with, uh, who with her husband went to Shushi and then he, she spent uh, several months in Azerbaijan captivity. So at that time, the idea was that, that okay, guys, Armenia needs Armenians, so we have demograph demographic problems. Let's uh, not uh, replicate the mistakes which have been done in 2003-2004. When there was a disaster in Iraq and many Armenians, Iraqi Armenians came to Armenia and then left. And also, let's uh, not replicate uh, mistakes during the Syrian civil war when a lot of Syrian Armenians came to Armenia. Some stayed in Armenia, maybe some 15, 17 thousand, but again, uh, another 15 or even 20,000 left for Europe and United States. So the discussions were focused how to bring Lebanese Armenians back to Armenia, somehow to solve the demog demographic problems for Armenia. But now, because Armenia has a lot of problems, economic, social, economic, political, military, for example, just today we lost two soldiers uh, who had been killed by Azerbaijani right. fire, one in Yeras, just 57 kilometers from Yerevan, another in the Yerevan region. So now, frankly speaking, there is no much discussions about Lebanon, what's going on there or what's not going on there. Even uh, the topic that, okay, let's bring Lebanese Armenians, I don't know, the 35,000 or 40,000 people, let's make efforts to bring them back to Armenia and not to allow them to go to Europe or the United States. Even uh, this type of talks are not very familiar currently in Armenia. And a lot of people in Armenia itself are calling Armenia a failed state. Yeah, it looks like today we're, we're going to be talking a lot about failed states. And speaking of which, the next one on our list is Afghanistan. It's been in the news, obviously, if, if you're following the news. Uh, before 2020, before the war in 2020, some Armenian regional analysts were warning us that, you know, Armenian policymakers have a blind spot when it comes uh, gen in generally to the region, whether it's the Middle East or Central Asia. And they were saying that basically that what happens in Baghdad or Aleppo is much more consequential to Armenia than what takes place in Paris or Brussels. That seemed to prove itself right with Syria, especially, uh, as we saw in the war. But today we'd like to spend some time and discuss major tectonic shifts occurring less than a thousand miles from Armenia's border to the east uh, or southeast, to be precise, in Afghanistan. Uh, following nearly 20 years of occupation, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, which uh, commenced with a peace agreement signed between U.S. and Taliban on February 29, 2020, last year, is drawing to an end. And to date, uh, more than 240,000 people have been killed uh, in that conflict, with uh, more than 71,000 of them being civilians. The official deadline set by, by the Biden administration is August 31, 2021. 
But this weekend, we learned that Taliban has already taken full control of Afghanistan, or 99% control, let's say. Um, and they're already at the gates of the capital, Kabul, uh, amid reports that uh, Ashraf Ghani, uh, president of Afghanistan, has relinquished power and fled the country. And despite Biden claiming that Taliban control over Afghanistan was not a predetermined solution, despite assurances that, you know, it would take many months for them to sort of, you know, conquer Afghanistan, uh, Taliban's adv advance was at such a lightning pace that even Western powers were forced to evacuate their embassies under emergency conditions. The Afghan armed forces uh, that support the central government, uh, which numbered in the hundreds of thousands and which the U.S. spent years in training, equipping, um, you know, um, to act as a bulwark against the Taliban, have disappeared or evaporated more precisely in an instant. So... Uh, and then we hear we hear that uh, the Taliban is likely to declare the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan as the government uh, that governs the region uh, from Kabul in the following days. Asped, I gave uh, some background, but uh, for the uninitiated, you know, can you give a brief uh, overview of who the Taliban are, and uh, you know how did they come to power in Afghanistan so quickly? Right. Well, um, in terms of the landscape in which uh, the Taliban appeared, we're talking about uh, you know years of war against the Soviet uh, Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, where the various groups were equipped by the U.S., supported by the U.S. Uh, towards the end, uh, were fighting the the Soviet army. Um, the Taliban actually were created or were formed in 19, uh, early 1990s, 1994, around then, by a person, uh, by a guy named uh, Mullah Muhammad Omar. Um, he only had, you know, 50 people and the Talib, Taliban, Talib means a religious student. Um, he basically formed that. But within, um, within a very short period, they managed to actually consolidate their power. Uh, to a large extent because of their ideology, because of their robust ideology and the promise of security and stability, uh, even though uh, they were, uh, in, in, ter in, in, their, in, in terms of their religious interpretation, they were quite radical. And at the same time, the Pakistan's uh, ISI, the Inter-Service Intelligence Agency, the strong, powerful agency uh, in Pakistan, they supported the Taliban. Uh, hoping that uh, in the existing chaos, uh, post-Soviet uh, uh, withdrawal uh, chaos, uh, the, the new power, the Taliban, would be able to uh, establish a favorable government, a favorable to Pakistan. By 1996, the Taliban were or already advancing and other groups were not able to resist them, including one of the more famous, Ahmad Shah Massoud, uh, the, the Mujahideen group, which formed the Northern Alliance to stop the Taliban. By right. 19... Uh, 96 up until 2001 the Taliban were in complete and uh, absolute control of the country uh, so, interestingly enough uh, you know uh, on September 9th uh, uh, right two days of 2001 right uh, before two days before the 9/11 attacks uh, on the World Trade Center uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud was assassinated by Taliban right. uh, so it was a coordinated attack uh, coordinated between al-qaeda and uh, the Taliban, even though we have to keep in mind that the Taliban, while supported or gave refuge, so, say, uh, safe haven to the, the Al-Qaeda and other troops and other groups, radical groups, they never initiated any attack outside of Afghanistan. Their focus Aspen. has been in Afghanistan. Of course, they do have affiliated groups in Pakistan. Quick question on that regard. So before the uh, Taliban came on the, uh, you know, uh, became an, an enemy of the U.S., I guess that was a few years before 9-11 uh, happened. Is it true that the United States was actually involved in funding uh, the Taliban through Pakistan or maybe even uh, founding uh, the Taliban movement or helping found it? You know, there's the law of there's a Hovik, there's a, the law of un, unintended consequences. Uh, you know, this argument about the United States intentionally intentionally sort of funding uh, the Taliban. I, as much as I know, as far as I have observed, is not true. The same thing can be said about uh, ISIL, right? Um, what happens is that it was uh, the United States putting its eggs in the wrong uh, in in one basket or in the wrong baskets to start with, and in this case, the uh, the Pakistani ISI. 
uh, has been actually uh, kept a lot of uh, information away from the U.S. This is the reason why when uh, the U.S. Special Forces uh, tried to, well, uh, they assassinated Osama bin Laden, they didn't uh, inform the Pakistani services and the intelligence services. So it is always about the unintended consequences. It's, it's, it's always about the U.S. not intentional, unintentionally probably created or helped strengthen but uh, to argue that the, uh, the United States did actively seek and uh, to, to strengthen the Taliban uh, is, is problematic. The problem here was that the Taliban refused to give up the Al-Qaeda. Everyone knew that it was Al-Qaeda that uh, you know, was behind the 9-11. Uh, the Taliban were giving, were giving them refuge and the, the, the Taliban refused uh, to rescind or to, uh, to allow or to hand over al-Qaeda, just like the same excuse was used in 2003 to invade Iraq uh, on a bogus assumption that al-Qaeda is operating and supported by Saddam Hussein. Um, and uh, that goes into a whole different uh, discussion. Uh, but uh, yeah. I don't believe that there was a planned, uh, intentional plan to fund and, and create uh, the Taliban by the U.S. Okay, so then uh, the U.S. invaded, I guess, Afghanistan in October of 2001, uh, right after uh, September 11. And here we are, I guess, 20 years later. What was the U.S. focus when it was uh, occupying Afghanistan? Was it focused on nation building or was it like more short term military objectives? Um, that actually, surprisingly, in Afghanistan, they had a better plan than they did in Iraq. Uh, the goal was to eradicate al-Qaeda, uh, to remove uh, uh, the Taliban who were supporting al-Qaeda and establish a government, support it, make it run on its own, uh, and basically withdraw. Uh, the February uh, 2020 agreement, uh, as you mentioned, uh, um, uh, basically um, was uh, a prelude of that. And this, uh, um, yes, uh, February 2020, and it was an agreement signed by the Trump administration, and it was uh, aimed at basically see, looking, seeing that you know there is no way out of this. The Taliban have not been weakening. If anything, they were all powerful in in the regions outside of major urban areas. So at the time, the goal was to uh, again create a government of national unity and so on and so forth. But as always, uh, they couldn't find people. Uh, that would be accepted by all. In other words, they actually relied on people that they trusted, the U.S. trusted, without realizing to what extent uh, these people would be accepted by them. You know, Hamid Karzai, the president, former president of Afghanistan, was an outsider. Uh, he was not part of the local elite. He didn't rise from the local elite. Um, so um, this is the reason why I think uh, it lasted for 20 years. And um, even when people talk about this, that, oh, this is Biden's major gaffe uh, of leaving Afghanistan and so on, you know, the foundations of this was put um, uh, years ago, even before Trump, you know, there were, expl uh, there were exploring, the U.S. was exploring ways to get out of that quagmire. Benjamin, do you have any thoughts about why the U.S. and NATO decided to withdraw from Afghanistan? No, I, I, Osbet gave us some, you know, uh, information and do you think that in withdrawing from Afghanistan today, uh, did the U.S. like was able were they able to fully calculate the consequences of their decision uh, on the future of the region? Uh, my understanding is that uh, approximately uh, when Obama took the power in 2009, it was clear that uh, they uh, almost totally or fully destroyed Al Qaeda. But also at that time, during the Bush administration, we all know that the neoconservatives had the idea of democracy promotion, nation building, etc., etc. So the mission was transformed during the Bush administration from purely, okay, we should defeat Al-Qaeda and then get out from Afghanistan, from some idea that we should uh, leave Afghanistan only when we will have some, if not a fully liberal democratic state, but at least some functioning state, some pro uh, American state with at least some features of modern Western democracy. And during Obama administration, it was clear that this project is failed. And Obama made some efforts uh, to leave Afghanistan. At the beginning, he made a decision to surge in Afghanistan, like George W. Bush made a decision to have surge in Iraq in 2007, hoping that, okay, this temporary surge will be will weaken Taliban to that extent that when United States will leave, okay, the Afghan government will not allow the Taliban to take power. But then it was clear that this is a way to nowhere, and when Trump 
came uh, into power, we all know that one of the main promises of Trump was to end the so-called endless wars. And okay, uh, Trump uh, significantly reduced the United States involvement both in Iraq and Syria. Uh, we know that currently Americans have 2,500 soldiers on Iraqi soil and they have approximately 1,000 soldiers in Syrian soil. Uh, but from a larger perspective, I believe uh, for the United States or for the Western world, this can be perceived as a failure because many uh, countries in the Silk Road, they will see this as a failure of U.S. policy or another failure of U.S. policy of nation building or democracy promotion or democracy building, like what the case in Iraq. So we all know that when Americans left Iraq in 2011, there was no democracy. And then Americans were forced to come back to Iraq and Syria when ISIS was established and when ISIS conquered Mosul and declared its caliphate. And another thing Significant issue is that now we are seeing how Americans are living very quickly and how they are abandoning part of Afghans who serve for Americans, work for them. Also, Americans established the so-called special visa program for Afghans, but as for now, they brought only some 2,000 uh, people back to the United States with so-called special visas. And we saw yesterday and today in the morning the horrible uh, scenes or uh, videos from the Kabul International Airport when people literally were climbing to the American military planes, asking them, okay, to take us. And this will send some shockwaves in the third world that, okay, if you are dealing with the United States, you have received a lot of guarantees, but then, for whatever reason, Americans decided, okay, uh, we are going to leave, uh, you will have a face to contact us. Because my understanding is that uh, many Afghan officials, police, and etc., etc., for coming weeks and months, will have to face consequences by Taliban for working for the United States. So, uh, from my point of view, strategically, there are uh, two, two important uh, implications which may have after this uh, Afghanistan partner. First, uh, another failure of the United States democracy promotion or nation building process outside of the Western world in the Middle East or Greater, or at least in the Greater Middle East. And second, that um, uh, you cannot 100% count on American guarantees that you may work for Americans, you may support them, but then they may leave your country and you have to face uh, with the consequences. Uh, so these are uh, more strategic implications for what we are seeing in last days in Afghanistan from my point of view. In your opinion, uh, Benjamin, do you think there is enough here at stake for world powers to actually collaborate in order to stabilize the region? Or are we going to see a repeat of the great game, sort of in the historic great game scenario where uh, it's a zero-sum game and uh, each power is working to the detriment of the other for their own narrow interests? It's very difficult to assess what will happen, but my understanding is that at least several powers are trying to come into trouble with Taliban. We all know that Russia, they were both in public and secret negotiations with Taliban, and even today, uh, Russian foreign ministry made a very interesting statement that uh, it's much easier to negotiate and have deals with Taliban than with President Navalny. And just a few hours ago, a Russian ambassador in Afghanistan made a statement that currently in Kabul situation is much better than with the seven years of Afghan Ghani presidency. Ghani, the first time, was elected president in 2014. And also we saw that just uh, two weeks ago, I believe, uh, the uh, Taliban leaders, they I went to China and they publicly met with Chinese foreign minister. So it's a very interesting situation. At least as far as I can understand, uh, Russia and China, they seek to come into turn with Taliban. For China, okay, if they are able to include uh, Afghanistan into the Belt and Road Initiative, it will open for them another route to Iran, either yes. directly, because Afghanistan is a very small, like 60 kilometer land border with China, but it's very complicated area, high mountainous area. But from Pakistan, they may have created routes and even railroads to connect, for example, from Peshawar to Kabul and from Kabul to Iran. Because currently, China has only one railway connection with Iran. It's uh, China, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Iran railway. But from Belt and Road Initiative, I believe Chinese would be happy to have another railway connection with Iran via Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan. And we all know that uh, Pakistan is uh, more and more becoming like a Chinese pawn or China dependent country. And this CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, is a flagship uh, project of Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. So, China is interested to have some kind of, if not friendly relation with Taliban, but at least some normal relation with Taliban. And especially, we should not forget that in Afghanistan, there are goals, there are 
some other mining resources like copper, iron, etc., etc. And so, okay. uh, from Chinese perspective, Afghanistan could be also uh, good aiding on their resources to get resources, as what they are doing, for example, in Africa, also in Latin America. Yeah, Benjamin uh, mentioned uh, Iran, so I wanted to sort of turn to that country. Uh, it seems like, I guess, you know, with Russia and China signaling that they're, they they want to cooperate with uh, Taliban, uh, Iran for many years has been sort of a very, I guess, mortal enemy of Taliban. And while the Pashtun are the major predominant, I mean, the predominant ethnic group in Afghanistan comprising more than 40% of the population, not too far below that, uh, you know, in the same order of magnitude, there is, uh, you know, there are Tajik and Hazara tribes, which are uh, Persian speaking, and many of them also following Shiite, you know, Shiite beliefs. And also, we also know that Afghanistan over the last 20 years, especially, uh, has served as a major source of drug cultivation, and Iran has been used as a conduit for that. Uh, Asped, do you think Iran will also, you know, make an about face and start col- uh, collaborating with uh, Taliban? Or do you see sort of maybe risks to the, you know, uh, to the relationship between Iran and Taliban? Well, um, one thing we need to realize that then when the Taliban established their rule in Afghanistan, they became one of the major challenges of Iran, a major uh, concern for Iran. Uh, and along with uh, Saddam Hussein, Iraq, uh, uh, Iran uh, felt that it was surrounded. If anything, the U.S. actually did Iran a huge favor by getting rid of the Taliban, at least initially, and then also getting rid of uh, Saddam Hussein, which allowed Iran to expand. Well, that now, was the only what time does when the new um, Taliban rule would look like. Yeah, I, I meant to say that actually uh, the U.S. collaboration with that was one of the few times uh, in recent history where U.S. collaborated directly with Iran. Uh, in order to uh, reduce the influence of Taliban. Is that correct? Well, they did. It wasn't cooperation, and it wasn't really a co- cooperation as much as it was congruence of interest, right? Just like it happened in Iraq uh, with against ISIL, where Shia groups, militias, Iran, and the U.S. side by side were fighting against ISIL. Um, so uh, from that perspective, I think it all it all depends on what Taliban 2.0 government would look like in uh, in Afghanistan if they're going to be looking at Shia um, uh, the Shia minority or Shia Islamic Republic of Iran as a rival as heretics or not. So it is um, something that is very concerning for Iran. Uh, the border on their eastern border is under. Um, Sort of, it could be under threat, but it all depends on again what would the uh, uh, the the sort of the policies or the uh, the credo of the new Taliban government in terms of foreign policy. I'm not talking about internally, uh, rather their foreign policy would be like. How would they articulate it? How would they go about with that? Uh, so, it is a major concern. And also, don't forget, you know, by some accounts, ninety uh, percent of the world's opium uh, comes from Afghanistan. And most of it goes to Iran. Uh, so there is a, an under, underground major, you know, a drug trade going on there. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, how would that have an impact on the bilateral relations or the global impact uh, remains to be seen. But I guess Moscow as well has uh, similar concerns. Is that correct? In terms of both narco trafficking as well as an arc of instability all around its uh, southern borders, whether you know it's Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, right. or Tajikistan that have direct uh, borders with Afghanistan, and the latter two of them being part of CSTO. So if there is any potential sort of uh, conflict uh, with those two countries, then this brings up our favorite organization uh, recently, uh, CSTO, and how that would how they would deal with it. You see, one of the things is that, you know, in Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan and lesser extent Tajikistan, they are both, uh, you know, have authoritarian governments and uh, they might be willing. I mean, again, the same logic have happened with Iraq, uh, with the rise of uh, Al-Qaeda and so on. The authoritarian governments don't like groups like that, regardless of what religion they are. Uh, So uh, from that perspective. Um, uh, obviously, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan are quite wary about uh, Taliban expansion or influence on, uh, on, on in, their, in their territory. But then the business of business is business, right? And drug business is a business. So uh, regardless of how concerned Russia is or how concerned Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan are about a Taliban influence in the region, I think the issue of the drug trade uh, would not be uh, uh, would not create a coalition. Let's put it this way. And again, I need to emphasize this: that 
you know, uh, I was just having this discussion uh, with a colleague of mine and, um, and we were talking about this and uh, she did bring up the idea that Afghanistan, the Taliban never once, you know, went outside of Afghanistan. They were never once a threat uh, trying to actively destabilize countries in the region, uh, in their na na neighboring countries. So um, maybe Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Russia as well, they would say live and let live kind of a situation, where as long as they do not instigate any problems, um, you know, the drug business is part of life. Lastly, before we come back to Armenia, over the past uh, decades, we've seen uh, regionally uh, expansionist Turkish foreign policy, and Turkey today uh, also acts as a significant player in the region. Uh, we know now that, for instance, NATO has outsourced the security of the Kabul airport to Ankara. And we also know that Turkey has sort of tried to carve out a room for, uh, in its, as part of its contingent for, I guess, more than 100 uh, Azerbaijani soldiers to be part of this force. If I, I wanted to ask you, Benjamin, uh, what are Turkey's aspirations in the region? Uh, okay, my understanding is that when uh, Turkey suggested its uh, troops uh, to be deployed in Kabul International Airport, Definitely, uh, they um, didn't uh, think that uh, Kabul will be under Taliban control already on August 15th. So they saw that, okay, there could be some vacuum and it's the right place to uh, inject Turkey and also to offer some kind of service to United States and to NATO. And this will somehow uh, improve relations with NATO because we all know about the, a lot of troubles between Turkey and different NATO member states, starting from the United States and ending from France. So yes, uh, they suggested that, okay, we can be useful for you. We know that you all want to leave Kabul, but okay, give us money and we will be there. And also we can come into turn with Taliban. Uh, because let's remember just, just uh, 10 days ago, Erdogan stated that, okay, we can not only uh, deal with NATO to secure the Kabul airport, but we are ready also to have direct uh, dialogue or direct negotiations with Taliban. Because, okay, we both are Muslim Muslim countries, we both are Sunni Muslim countries, etc., etc. But currently, when Taliban controlling Kabul airport, I'm not sure that uh, this uh, Turkish offer is still valid, at least for a long term. We all know that, for example, the United States significantly increased the number of troops deployed in Afghanistan. Uh, several uh, thousand more troops have been deployed in Kabul airport, but only to secure the evacuation of American and also foreign nationals. And after that, Americans will leave because even after the fall of Kabul, President Biden and the American administration stated that yes, they are fully committed to withdraw all American forces until end of August. So if, when Taliban is controlling uh, all Afghanistan, and especially the Kabul, I'm not sure that this Turkish offer is still valid and what these Turkish troops, yes, and with these 100 Azerbaijani troops are going to do in Kabul airport. But more general, my understanding is that uh, still Pakistan has a uh, strong influence over Taliban. Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, I know, intel materials that maybe they are not controlling Taliban as much as in early 1990s. But in any case, uh, connections are still there. And we all know that Turkey-Pakistan relations are burgeoning recently. Political relations, cooperation in defense, industrial uh, field, and etc. etc. So my understanding is that Turkey, through so its connections with Pakistan, will try to have uh, some backdoor negoti negotiations with Taliban and thus present its, itself. Uh, especially within NATO, as a country through which NATO can reach to Taliban for some maybe clandestine or not public negotiation. And thus, Turkey will try to increase its role or its uh, power within NATO, telling them, okay guys, if you want to have um, connections with Taliban, but you don't want to have direct connections because Taliban uh, broke this uh, February 29, 2020 deal, because according to the deal, Taliban should not enter coupled by force and they should negotiate with Ghani government for some power sharing agreement. Okay, Turkey may say, we understand that now you have to face, save your face, you are not going to recognize Taliban, you are not going to have direct public negotiations with Taliban, you are not going to uh, have a meeting with Taliban leader in the White House, but we all understand that you have some businesses with uh, Taliban regarding the regional security, regarding the rights, etc., etc. So, through my connection with Pakistan, I, I can be some conduit between some NATO members and Taliban, or some NATO members, Pakistan and Taliban, and thus to show that, okay, he can be somehow useful for NATO state and also to add some leverage within NATO. And one thing, if I may, Hovi, to add on what Benjamin said, it's that uh, I completely agree with uh, uh, with Benjamin's analysis and comment. 
and I would add one more thing is that Turkey is also trying to find a direct contact with the Taliban uh, rather than just going through Afghanistan. I mean, Erdogan mentioned it a couple of times uh, that, you know, they are willing uh, to negotiate, to act as mediators and so on and so forth. Uh, I personally am not aware of how the Taliban view uh, Turkey, uh, what is their perception of Turkey, but uh, at least Erdogan, this is part of his soft power. Um, and uh, I don't know what is the situation now in the Kabul airport, which is uh, a fluster cluck uh, because we don't have to beep uh, to the mm-hmm. to these. But uh, and Turkey is in charge of that airport, so um, I, that would uh, actually could uh, be uh, an indicator of how Turkey can play a role, if any, uh, with the Taliban regime. Do any of you see a direct threat to the to Armenia itself, or alternatively, people have been talking about you know Azerbaijan trying to take advantage of just distraction of world powers to foment another conflict? You know, what what are sort of what what should Armenian policymakers be aware of uh, with regard to Afghanistan? Benjamin, maybe you could start for us, and Osbed, if you have anything else to add. Okay, if I may uh, jump in, I don't see any short-term direct influence or implications for Armenia. Some analysts argue that, okay, this may uh, bring the shift of focus of Russia from South Caucasus to the Central Asia, or Russia maybe will be forced to relocate some resources from South Caucasus to Central Asia, which will make it easier for Turkey to further strengthen its influence here, and this will be detrimental for Armenia's interests. But I don't share these ideas. I believe that Russia is still in a position to increase its involvement or influence or presence, even military presence in Central Asia, without decreasing its involvement and military presence in South Caucasus. So no direct uh, short-term implications for Armenia. But strategically, if Turkey can somehow use uh, this situation to strengthen its general position and also to strengthen its position within NATO, and as far as Turkey is um, implementing and overt uh, anti-Armenian policy, yes, this indirectly may affect Armenia, because if Turkey becomes stronger somehow, it's not good for Armenia, but this is, of course, indirect influence. All right, we'll, we'll have to leave it at that for Afghanistan. Now, coming back to Armenia, uh, we want to give you a quick update on what's happening uh, uh, internally, I guess, politically, and the major thing that happened over the last two weeks, uh, the major, some would say, you know, soap opera, some would say... Uh, you know, even worse things, was the eighth convocation of the Armenian parliament. Uh, but, you know, surprisingly, the outcome of that work for the last two weeks, we, ha- we, sa- we saw like the both the, the, the government and opposition parties at each other's throats. But as a result of that work, uh, the positive thing we have is that the, you know, the 12 parliamentary standing committee chairs have been finally approved. And because of the share of the votes that each party, uh, each uh, party and coalition got, nine of those uh, parliamentary, you know, chairpersons are now from civil contract, while the three are from the opposition. And Hayastan Alliance gave uh, one of those three to I have honor. So essentially, we have two, we have nine for civil contract, two seats for um, Hayastan, and one seat for I have honor. The interesting things, I guess, are that. You know, Narek Zeynalyan, Arman Yegoyan, and Vahe Galumyan from the seventh convocation of the Armenian parliament were re-elected. And so was uh, Andrani Kocharyan as well, who was, who was elected as a chairman for the Standing Commission Committee on Defense and Security, which was the most important, I think, uh, committee that uh, the opposition was eyeing and didn't get. Benjamin, any major sort of things that you noted from this uh, last parliament session and the, the committees uh, th- themselves? Okay, for me, nothing uh, important or nothing surprising. Uh, okay, according to the so-called uh, don't uh, system, it was obvious that uh, much of uh, positions of committee chairs or chairmen will go to the civic contract party and several will go to the uh, Armenian alliance and also I'm not surprised regarding the candidates. Maybe one candidate, the candidate of Andrani Kocharyan, is a little bit surprising because, in any case, Armenia suffered a disastrous defeat in war during the, in 2020. And uh, Mr. Kocharyan was the chairman of the same committee. And Armenia is a parliamentary republic, which means that this committee has the power for uh, supervising or for uh, overhauling the defense uh, sector in general. 
Also, it's a little bit strange uh, to trust the same person to have this, this uh, uh, very important and significant position, especially in parliamentary republic. Uh, despite the fact that, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, we had a disastrous implications or dis disastrous result of 2020 war. Everything else is uh, politics and not very interesting, and I don't believe that uh, really the current the parliament uh, will have much to do. Because, okay, it was controlled by civic uh, contract party, and we all know that in civic contract party there's a very narrow circle of decision makers, uh, headed by uh, Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan, and mostly the member of parliament, they simply they are going to vote for anything which um, Prime Minister will tell, and I'm not sure that they are really able to uh, implement the uh, supervising authorities. And, for the opposition, definitely they will continue harsh criticism against Nikol Pachinyan. But in any case, we are in parliamentary republic, and at the end of the day, there will be votes. And the civic contract has cleared the majority of uh, 71 and this for 107. Right. Um, and I should mention that the uh, on the opposition side, the uh, standing committees on uh, you know regional Euro and Eurasian uh, integration as well as the Standing Committee on Economic Affairs uh, went to the Armenia Alliance, while the uh, Standing Committee on Human Rights Protection went to uh, Tagu Yutov Masan from I Have Honor. But going back to the issue of this uh, tit and tat between the parliamentary uh, you know, forces, the ruling party, uh, inter interestingly, has criticized the opposition for using such strong and divisive language, or what they would call divisive language, the opposition have claimed that this is a political, you know, the terms like, uh, you know, capitulant or terms like hogatu in Armenian uh, are a political uh, evaluation of the government's role. And But, you know, uh, Aspet, uh, quickly, I wanted to ask you, given the limited set of tools in the, op the hands of the opposition, is there anything else that you would, we would expect them to do other than you know, do something like what Nikol Pashinyan did when he was in the opposition and be as poignant as he can and, and be a thorn, essentially, in the government side until uh, the situation changes for them. Right. Um, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, in a situation where the, the parliament is dominated, the National Assembly is dominated, dominated by one party and the opposition does not have a valid sort of any ability to block or to uh, to stop any process. The only thing is part that they can do is use the parliament as a forum to express their ideas and, uh, you know, to uh, their dissatisfaction and so on. And because of that, they all can also get airtime, right? Because of the National Assembly uh, proceedings are, are broadcast uh, broadcast live more often than not. So um, I, I personally don't see anything unless in the next couple of uh, months uh, or the months to come, uh, the opposition is able to consolidate or find institutional mechanisms, leverages to um, to you know, push their agenda forward, whatever that agenda would be. Uh, but uh, from the rhetoric, from uh, how things are going, I think um, you know it's going to be another uh, sort of parliament where uh, the majority would rule and the minority or the opposition would just end up making noise without much uh, of a bite. Right. Uh, the opposition has also alleged that the government has actually tightened uh, the screws on media freedom in the parliament but you know we'll try to cover that next uh, time and so in the interest of time we will uh, you know let's talk a little bit about Artsakh and just regional sort of post-war dynamics the last two weeks we saw Stanislav Zas chairman of the CSTO uh, visiting Yerevan we also saw uh, defense minister Karapetyan visiting Moscow what was interesting was that during Zas's visit Karapetyan gave a strong dressing down essentially indicating that we were expecting ZAS uh, as early as May and that CSTO activities don't correspond to operational needs on the ground. Karapetyan also said that Armenia reserves the right to use force if Azerbaijani violations uh, on Armenian territory uh, go, you know, continue, I guess. I forget the exact term of it, whether it was meant. Was the statement meant at a CSTO or was it actually uh, meant towards Azerbaijan? Also, in addition to all of this, we saw that, you know, in Russia, uh, the Shoigu, Russia's defense minister, talked about more uh, military aid to Armenia and reinvigorating, essentially, Armenia's um, uh, armed forces. So do you see all these statements in conjunction as more of sort of a 
coordinated uh, uh, speech by Armenia or uh, and Russia to send a message to Azerbaijan, or is it more haphazard? Yeah, Benjamin. So my understanding is that the main audience of our defense minister statements uh, was neither OCSTO and nor Azerbaijan. It was a domestic audience to send the messages that okay, the new defense minister is a tough guy and he's in a position to say tough words towards the CSTO Secretary General. Because in reality, if Armenia wants to send any messages to Azerbaijan, there are a lot of direct channels, and I'm sure that still there are direct channels between uh, the Ministry of Defenses or Ministry of Defenses and also in the higher level. This is the first. Uh, so there is no need to send messages uh, to Azerbaijan in front of CFTO Secretary General. And the second, frankly speaking, is a strange statement. We all know that more than three months, Azerbaijani troops are occupying approximately 60 square kilometers of Armenian territory. 60 square kilometers in Sunik province and in Georgian province. And then after three months of uh, current situation to say that okay if this will continue Armenia believes that he should have the right or Armenia has the right to uh, use the force and etc etc frankly speaking I don't think that anyone is going to bite seriously these statements maybe in Azerbaijan or in Russia so again the main uh, audience was a domestic audience to show that the new minister of defense is a tough guy and he can uh, say tough words uh, to the CFO secretary uh, secretary in general. Regarding this uh, situation in Arsat, my understanding is that uh, Azerbaijan has nothing to hurry. They simply will wait and see if the current status quo continues. I mean, this absolute ambiguity and certainty regarding the future of Arsat, the uh, future of Arsat status, the future of Russian troops, etc., etc., etc. My understanding is that uh, Armenia slowly but steadily will continue to leave Arsat. So Azerbaijan uh, now has nothing to do. Uh, he simply should digest the territories which it took, this more than 8,000 square kilometers, which it took during the 2020 war. And we all understand that he is not able to do that very quickly. Most probably they will choose uh, some several spots, especially Shushi, and they will try to make them something like in Dubai or Disneyland by pulling money into that. And that is why my understanding is that they uh, will complete this uh, feasibly Airport of the late September to have very close access uh, to Shushi, and they are also now constructing this new highway connecting uh, Fizuli uh, via uh, connecting Fizuli with uh, Shushi. So Azerbaijan will do nothing, and they simply will wait and see how Armenians are leaving Arsa. And again, if nothing changes, so the situation may, uh, remains uh, as it is now. My understanding is that in uh, five or ten years we have the double. We have the two times less of Armenian population in Arsat than we have now, approximately in 2025. So I don't think that uh, Azerbaijan has nothing uh, to worry about Arsat. But what Azerbaijan wants is to force Armenia to provide routes, and you may call it routes, roads, corridor, or whatever else, to provide routes for Azerbaijan to be connected with the Nafidevan Autonomous Republic and in larger extent with Turkey via Sunnic province. This is the most important thing for Azerbaijan, and that is why they are. Uh, increasing pressure on our Armenia. Uh, just as I mentioned just today, we have uh, two soldiers killed, one in Geras and then the second one in Gerasmus province. And now Azerbaijanis are uh, targeting with direct fire the several villages in Gerasmus region. So uh, Azerbaijan understands that if nothing changes, okay, they simply have to wait for another five and ten years to see less and less of the Armenian population in Arsa. Now they want uh, routes, corridor, or connections, or whatever else, to uh, Nafidevan Autonomous Republic via Sunni province. And this was made clear again by President Aliyev during his uh, recent interview to CNN2, when he stated that, okay, we need both railway connection via Sunni and also highway connection via Sunni to Nafidevan Autonomous Republic. This is my understanding of the situation. Going back to Artsakh, we we also saw over the last two weeks actually the fighting has been uh, Azerbaijan has taken the fighting to Artsakh itself. You know there were reports uh, of uh, shootouts there using very high caliber uh, weapons, uh, you know use of uh, use of attack drones. But you know since you've been in Artsakh recently, uh, Benjamin, maybe we can close today uh, with you with a recollection of your visit. There and you also recently had an article in Civilnet titled "How to Increase Visitors to Artsakh." What is what is your general impression of Artsakh today? Uh, where did you go and 
what are your suggestions? Uh, maybe we could, like a short summary of your article for us, for our listeners. Okay, if I will try to wrap up or very briefly produce my impressions and also what I think. So currently there is a, some sense of despair in Artsakh or hopelessness, and also there is a feeling in Artsakh that at least Republic of Armenia as a state forget about them, and much of Armenians forget about them. And this makes them feel that okay, if uh, currently we see Azerbaijani flag in Shushi, it means that no one can guarantee that we will not see Azerbaijani flag in Stepanakert maybe 10 years from now, if not 5 years. So many Armenians in Artsakh think, okay, why wait 10 years in Artsakh and then be forced to burn our houses and quickly relocate it to Armenia, uh, like uh, people did in Kasatar region in November 2020. So many think that, okay, let's use this time to uh, earn or to have uh, allocate some resources and then leave Artsakh with some money to have some decent life in Armenia or in Russia. So currently this is the situation and to top this, I mean at least to keep Armenians in Artsakh, I'm not speaking about bringing additional Armenians to Artsakh, I'm just speaking to keep right. the current level of Armenian population in Artsakh and not to lose the uh, gradual decrease of populations. There are things which can only the Republic of Armenia do. And these are things about, first of all, clear statement from Republic of Armenia regarding the status of territories which Azerbaijan took during the 44-day war. Because as of now, there is a no official assessment or official statement and ju judicial, juridical statement from Republic of Armenia. What Republic of Armenia believes are the status of those territories which Azerbaijan took during this 44-day war. This is the first which Armenia should do as a republic. And second, Armenia uh, should, and the Armenian Ministry of Defense and uh, General Staff, uh, they should make, make the statement that, okay, we are modernizing or changing our plans in uh, such a way so that we will be able to protect this 3,000 square kilometer of territory in case of Russian troops are, are living. So, but uh, we fully understand that this can be done only by uh, the Republic of Armenia authorities. But if for whatever reasons uh, authorities of the Republic of Armenia are not in a hurry to make such moves, there are three moves which can be done by Armenians as a nation. And as I put in my article, I don't believe that all 10 million Armenians in the world are thinking about Artsakh. But I hope that at least 10% of uh, Armenians, these 1 million people both in Armenia and diaspora, they think about Artsakh. And one of the issues is to send clear messages to Artsakh that at least these 1 million people, they don't forget about Artsakh, and uh, they really care about Artsakh, and uh, they care about Artsakh people. And one of the basic steps to do is to bring more Armenians as the visitors to Artsakh, because people who live in Stepanakir, in Martakir, in Askara, they should see people arriving and visiting Artsakh from Armenia. This is maybe the basic first step which can be done, and here we do not need any support or any content from the Republic of Armenia authorities. This can be done directly through some projects which can be cultivated by Artsakh authorities in direct connection or coordination or discussions with uh, those diaspora organizations or those Armenians in diaspora who care about Armenians, care about Artsakh. Even if 10% of all the Armenians are really think about Artsakh, this is a 1 million people and this is a quite significant force which can do some things even without direct involvement of the Republic of Armenia and the Republic of Armenia authorities. I wanted to thank everyone for joining. Katya, thank you for staying on with us from Beirut, Asped and Benjamin as well. Talk to you next time. Thank you for this interesting podcast and discussion. Thanks also to Katya and Asped. Thank you, Ovik. And that concludes our program for this episode of Groom Weekend Review. We hope it has helped your understanding of some of the issues from this previous week. We look forward to your feedback and suggestions for issues to cover in greater depth. Contact us on our website at groong.org, that's G-R-O-O-N-G, and on our Facebook page, ann-groong, or in our Facebook group, groong-armenian news network. Special thanks to Laura Osborne for providing the music for our podcast. I'm Hovik Manacharyan, and on behalf of everyone in this episode, I wish you a good week. Thank you for listening, and talk to you next week.